The primary purpose of Innovative AAC Solutions, the podcast, is to educate and inform. The views expressed during all episodes are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute educational or medical advice. They are not necessarily the views of Special School District of St. Louis County. Welcome back to Innovative AAC Solutions. We're back with another podcast episode. I can't wait to unpack this one with you guys. I think you are going to just love who I talked to today. Before we jump into the interview, of course, we have another joke that uh, is a little bit behind because we did finish the holiday season. But really, does the holiday season ever end? I don't think it does. So this is one of my favorite holiday jokes that I shared with my son, and I'm going to share it with you as well. And that is, what is taught at school in Santa's workshop? What is taught at school in Santa's workshop? The alphabet, of course. The alphabet. Take that back to your kids today, and I'm sure you will get a laugh. Uh, As far as laughing I had a great time with our next guest here on the podcast. It is Megan Stewart. She is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to our topic this year, which is literacy and AAC. So we're going to unpack a bunch of things with her. We kind of go every which direction, and there's so much jam-packed into a short amount of time. So sit back, relax, and stay tuned for my interview now with Megan Stewart. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Innovative AAC Solutions. I am here today with Megan Stewart. And Megan, you know, I just can't thank you enough for coming on today. I am so excited for us to dive into this topic. I It's near and dear to my heart. I know it's near and dear to your heart. <laughs> um, so before we jump into literacy and AAC, though, can you just give our listeners a little bit about you, your journey with everything, including AAC? Absolutely. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I was excited that you reached out. So um, like you said, I'm Megan Stewart. I'm a speech language pathologist. I have been for about 20 years now. Um, I write down very, well, I have been my whole career, but very passionate about AAC and literacy. I have worked in a variety of settings, including schools, which I'm in now. I've also done home health, early intervention, some hippotherapy. So some stuff with horses, which was awesome. Um, And so just a variety of different things that I've been able to do, always with a focus on those students with complex communication needs. Um, That's just something that I learned about when I was in grad school. And it has just, it was like, you know, when you find that moment and you're just like this, this is it. That was it for me. So it's been like gung ho from there. Um, And then literacy came in. It's always been a part of my life personally. I am a huge self-proclaimed book nerd. I love to read, always have. I was always that kid holed up in a corner with a book. Um, So I've always loved to use children's books in my therapy with students. Um, And then with the resurgence of everything or the coming to the forefront with the comprehensive literacy for all book and all of that, that just really reignited a fire under me um, because I've always believed, you know, that any kid can learn to read. It's just more about how we approach it for them. Um, So that's a very long winded explanation, but that is how I've kind of come to where I'm at now. Do you think that that's the reason you're so passionate about it? So, so for those who don't know, Megan does a lot on social media, um, sensible literacy, and Mm -hmm. it's a lot of resources related to AAC, but is that kind of why you got into, is that your passion or is it because you're a book nerd or why do you think that is? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think, you know, books have always just been a huge presence in my life all the time. Um, I love just reading kids books and young adult books and all the books. Um, And then seeing the connection too, when I started to use them in therapy um, and seeing the connection that kids have with the books um, and then being able to read the books with them and then talk through with them. And then being able to see that A lot of our kids, even though they might not be verbal and they might not be using their mouth words right now, they are reading and they're reading it up here. And we would never know if we didn't give them that opportunity to do that. So I think, you know, dispelling a lot of those myths of somebody is too something to be able to read 
um, and really advocating for our kids is a lot of where that passion has come from to integrate both of those. Yeah. Do you have any um, little anecdotes or things that you can reflect back on as far as someone in particular where you were like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on here where we just, uh, it's under the surface. Maybe we would never have known had we not given mm-hmm. them a chance. Yeah. So I've had a couple kids. A couple years ago, we had um, a set of twins at our school that we always knew were really, really, really intelligent. Um, and when they got their AAC devices, they just flew. And I mean, it just showed up even more, but they were still completely um, limited in their verbal. They didn't have any verbal words or anything like that. They had some vocalizations and stuff like that, but no words or word approximations. But we started doing some of that literacy stuff with them. And we were able to put an early reader in front of them and just give them some time to read it. And then we were able to ask them comprehension questions, follow-up questions, and without us reading it aloud to them, it was a brand new book and they were knocking them out of the park. Like it was, so it was just like, oh my gosh, you can read, oh my gosh. And so we just, and then like just doing like little phonics activities with them and seeing how easy it was for them. They kind of looked at us like, well, what, why is this such a shocking thing? Like (laughs) this is normal. This is my life. Um, And then more recently this year, here in preschool of all places, I had a little guy um, that I told his parents that he's a genius and I can't wait to see what he does. Um, But he loves different languages. His parents have never exposed him to different languages. They're a monolingual household, but he loves like, and they're even like Middle Eastern type languages and things like that, that are very much not part of his home culture. So um, he would hand write in these different languages Mm -hmm. and all this stuff and um, would transcribe things that he had seen and write them in these different languages. And one day on his AAC device, he said, where are the letters first? And then I showed him the letters and they were like these little letter shaped magnets that you can make letters out of. I actually have a post of it on my Instagram, but he changed it. So this was all on the keyboard too. It wasn't any symbols on a grid. He changed the letters. He deleted that part out and added the word Turkish. And he said, where is the Turkish? And I was like, are you going to teach me Turkish right now? And he got so excited. And he went over to the letter board and put the on the magnetic whiteboard. And he put all the letter shapes on there and started going through the Turkish alphabet and was spelling them out. I'm assuming they were correct. I don't know the Turkish alphabet. But and then he would look at me and say the sound. And then wait for me to say it back to him. And if I didn't say it correctly, he would say it again and let me kind of correct myself. Um, And he was thrilled the entire time. So those are two that really, really stick out for me as like if they didn't have exposure to A, the ability to try and show us and then B, the ability to have, you know, a keyboard where they could write everything out. I would never think to put the word Turkish on a kid's communication device or, uh, you know, anything like that. So um, those are two things, but every, I think every day I see a kid and it's just something new that they surprise me with. That goes back to the importance of autonomous communication too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need access to all 26 letters to be able to say, like, to be able to correct that and repair that too. It's not just, I want letters. I want Turkish so that I can have this social connection and moment with you to teach you Turkish. Yeah. Like what would have happened had you not, had he not had access to that? It's just, Oh, that's 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 so great. Exactly. Exactly. I was, I'm, I'm bummed that he's leaving us um, and he's going on to bigger and better things. But I told his parents, I just, I cannot wait to see what he does in this world because it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like in those two examples, you know, I don't, I don't know if they were kind of on the conventional literacy path once you kind of realized that, or if they were kind of on the emergent literacy road initially, and you kind of moved them over. But, um, you know, we know reading doesn't always look the same for everyone. So Mm -hmm. based off of those kind of definitions that we've, we've talked about in some other episodes, emergent versus conventional literacy and, and those skills, what can you describe to the listeners who may be not familiar with that, Mm -hmm. what it can look like for different abilities or even ages? Absolutely. So you were right. Some of those kids, they were in different spots. So Initially, we thought that one set of twins was on the emergent path, but they quickly showed us that they were beyond all of that. Um, But definitely, um, I focus more on the emergent part, just typically because I work with preschoolers. But again, 
you can see things while you're working through those emergent skills like shared reading and predictable chart writing and, you know, some of those phonics and fluency skills, then you can work on some of that and then they can quickly surprise you and show you that they are ready to move over or have like that hybrid approach where you can do a little bit of both to kind of fill in some of those spots that they might need extra support. Um, but definitely we do a lot of shared reading um, where we, you know, talk through the book, we do picture walks, we talk about the letters that we see in the book and all of those wonderful emergent strategies. Um, and I think that you can do that um, I've actually done it with lots of different agents. So, um, you know, you might just be looking at different types of books or talking about different things within the same type of book. I actually had a middle school um, site coach here who's like a curriculum coach. Um, and she used the book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie with middle schoolers to talk about, um, I'm going to forget what it was exactly, but it was something about finance and trade mm -hmm. and like higher level stuff that yeah. you would imagine for a middle schooler, but she used this kid's picture book. So being able to just kind of adjust your activities and things like that, I think is more, more important than the age level of the book. Um, yeah. if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, I think you can do a lot of emergent literacy stuff with the same books that you could do, um, you know, the conventional literacy stuff. Now, obviously, if you're working on like a chapter book, you might not be able to do that with the preschool age, but I think it can translate the other direction. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that takes a lot of creative ingenuity and innovation on her part too. Like I yeah. immediately went to like, oh, did she like have inspiration behind who moved my cheese? And then like took that to, <laughs> if you give a mouse a cookie. <laughs> yes, I know. And then she had another one that was like going on a bear hunt and it was like math skills or something like that, that they were working on. So it's just, it's kind of like, it's again, like that mindset shift of being like, no book has a specific population, just like, you know, all kids can learn how to read any, anybody can read any book. It doesn't only work for a certain age group or a certain demographic. And we hear that too, through a lot of the the PRC seminars and, and literacy programs um, and how we can go back to the fairy tales, right? The fairy mm -hmm. tales are, are mm -hmm. almost ageless in the sense that there's yeah. typically a resolution. There's, there's a climax within the story. We have characters that we can talk about and mm -hmm. um, a lot of principles that can ex be extrapolated to any age or any situation that you might find yourself in. So yeah, uh, I always tell my teams too, like if you, if you don't know where to start, start with some of those fables and fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, book walks and shared reading. What are some, you do such a nice job of giving examples of, of things on your social media, but what are some creative or innovative ways you've explored literacy through different activities? And, and then maybe we can chat about how then you would pull in an AAC device. Cause that's a question I get a lot and I'm yeah. sure you do too. Like, okay, well, I've got the reading down, but, but what about this, this device? Like, it's just one more thing. Right. So, right. so let's first talk about like, what are some activities that you guys yeah. have really found helpful? Yeah. Um, like you said, I love adding in little stuff. And I think that that helps with adding that comprehension piece and building those connections with the, with the story. So lots of things, I will look at a book and think, how can I make this book come alive? Like, how can I make this book be real for them instead of just flat 2D on a piece of paper? So I'll look at the book and like, so like for, if you give a mouse a cookie, we might, um, you know, make craft cookies, like little construction paper cookies afterwards, we might make real cookies, you know, and then those are lovely things that you can take that will expand your ability to read a book and have that variety or that repetition with variety, where you can just read the same book for like a month. And then they get to know the book and they get to know the things that you're talking about. And they get to know the vocabulary, but then you can add different activities on the end of it. So you could taste the chocolate chip cookies, you could make the chocolate chip cookies, you could graph who likes the chocolate chip cookies and who doesn't like the chocolate chip cookies and bring in math. Um, so I just kind of like to think of if I had this book, how can I make it real for these kids? How can I make the things that we're talking about real? Do we need to go out and do a motor activity and go on a bear hunt somewhere, you know, like our wonderful OTs made this sensory walk in the sensory room at our school after they read we're going on a bear hunt. And then the kids were able to go through different obstacles that mimicked going on a bear hunt activities. So um, 
I like to just pull things out if they've got sensory components in it to activate those senses too and build in that comprehension piece and that connection piece a little bit more. That's even better. Um, but even as something as simple as, like I said, like a little construction paper craft or something like that um, is a really easy way to start if you're looking to kind of like ease your way into something like that. Yeah. And I think that like sensory, like you mentioned, whether it be motor or sensory, whether it be like tactile and feeling of materials that can make it come alive, that's ageless. So yeah. even like you talk about bear hunt, right? Well, or, or there's the similar one with like a leaf hunt. I mm-hmm. think of, of like, okay, well, what's the textures of that feel like? Right. Right. Like, and we can talk about that. If it's preschoolers, we can talk about yucky, gross. And if it's teenagers, mm-hmm. we can say messy, disgusting, Right. Sus. Like I forget all the, 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 <laughs> I know. the G- Gen Z language now, but you know, um, I know. I turned to my three teenagers for that. I'm like, Hey guys, what, or I just listen to them. And I'm like, what does that word mean? Right. They're like, Oh mom. I know. So they <laughs> have that's to explain where I it. Get it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I think, um, just going back to the, like you said, the sensory pieces of how to make it come alive can be so helpful. And, and then just that piece that you said about it, not having, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every week. I think people get stuck in that. You got to switch out the book, but you can stay with a book a really long time. Yeah. yeah. Like just find I even a think detail. A month is sometimes short yes. and like you could just do it over and over. Cause yes, we, as adults, we might get sick of reading the same book. Like I think when my kids were little, Good night moon was their jam. And I probably could still repeat it. And they're 17 and 15. But so, but I was bored with the book. They weren't bored with the book. And it's the same, I think, with all ages of our kids. If it's your favorite book, you can reread it a hundred million times and they're not gonna care. Right. Especially if you're doing something different. Yeah. And that's a good example, right? So in that good night moon, right? There's um there's the the kittens and the mittens. So mm-hmm. just like are we talking about animals? There's a few different animals and like life cycles with those animals, maybe. Yeah. And then maybe we make mittens another day and we talk about things you can make or things around your some some life skills of things you might have in your bedroom that you would wear. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just, you know, find the little details like you're saying mm-hmm. and just extrapolate on them and just have that built into the story. Yeah. Love it. Um, okay. So, so that then kind of bridges to the question of, okay, we've got this and we're making it come alive. We're making the pages mm-hmm. come alive. How do we, how do we embed the device? What's the language look like? Cause that's right. a whole nother kit caboodle. <laughs> yes. I literally just got that question on Instagram yesterday. Um, after I posted about not adapting books, um, and that they're perfect just the way they are. Um, because you're right. It's a whole nother. They're like, okay, I've got all this. Now you want me to add this? Are you crazy? Like I can't, but then I like to, again, like you said, go back to the simple things. And if you're working with, whether it's high tech or mid tech or light tech, you can pick one word that is a theme throughout the book, whether it's in the text or it's in the pictures. So again, going on a bear hunt, the word go everywhere, right? Even if it's just doing your picture walk, it doesn't have to be in the text. You don't even have to read the text. That's what I tell a lot of my teachers. I'm like, just ignore the words. I don't, you make the story up. Just talk about what you see happening. What do you think is going to happen? So how I bring it in is picking one word. If they're really, really hesitant about it, just to have them start with one word. And especially if they're doing the book over a long period of time, typically teachers get very comfortable than with doing one and they just start naturally modeling other things um, without even realizing they're doing it. Um, so that's kind of where I, I start them, but it, just really paying attention to, you're just modeling in a different activity. So if they're good with modeling in the classroom all throughout the day, then this is just a little bit different of an activity. So you still don't have to bottle every single word. You're still not having to, you know, find new vocabulary. We can talk about that descriptive vocabulary piece where, you know, you just talk about what you see happening instead of programming like volcano into their communication device that they're never going to use again. Um, So that's kind of where I start them. And then it's a real, for me, it seems to be a real person by person basis as far as where we expand from there. But again, just trying to keep it real simple for them to start off and build that confidence up. Do you feel like you still have a lot of teachers and support staff that want to program in Volcano and the characters and all of the, the fringe? Some of them, 
some of them. I will say that my school has the last year and a half been really focused on the emergent literacy and have done a book study on the comprehensive literacy for all, um, which was actually led by our principal, which is just phenomenal. I just can't get enough of her. Um, but so that has helped kind of bridge that, you know, not having to see that as often, but I still do see that sometimes with some of the teachers are like, well, what if we just program this word? And I'm like, well, yeah, but how else can you talk about it? Like maybe, yeah, use that word every once in a while to give them that vocabulary, but here's something that's going to be a little bit longer lasting for them. Yeah. Love that. Love that. I love that you guys did a book study that was led by your principal. That's so that cool. Was amazing. She's phenomenal. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, well, it sounds like she's super supportive too. And absolutely just like speaking of support, you have like I mentioned earlier, great resources on both uh, your social media on Instagram, but also on your YouTube channel. So let's you. let's jump over to that for a second, because I, I just think that if you don't already have access to those resources, you should definitely give Megan a follow and check those out because I just think that they're very intuitive and helpful. Um, but if someone who's listening hasn't heard about them, can you just kind of do a little bit of a rundown and and talk yeah. about maybe the why and, and the what and, and kind of anything that any other tidbits or play things that you might be adding soon. Sure. I'm definitely going to be adding more because I haven't posted in a while, but um, I've got a list of things that I need to do, but it actually, my YouTube started like in the pandemic. So we were all stuck at home. We were like, what is this virtual learning business? How am I supposed to support my families? All of that. So I started it there because I was like, these families are in need of things. And I know that that's where a lot of people's YouTubes may have started, but I did mine specifically. It started out with you know, basics, like what is core vocabulary? What is AEC? What is modeling? What are all these terms that are being thrown out at me? Um, so I have some videos on that. And then I have some basic demonstration videos that I put together for my families too. Um, one is modeling AEC with Play-Doh. Um, that was just super easy. Cause again, I mo mainly work with preschoolers, but I wanted them to just see the families to just see, it doesn't have to be this big, production. It can be very, very simple and very easy. I will say a caveat, a lot of my, no, all of them are um, with TD Snap or with board maker symbols, but it can be easily transferable to other systems. So it's more about, it's not about the system. It's more about the process and the, the steps that you go through. Um, I also did some with um, ULS stories for that summer because they were um, seeing them online, but then they weren't able to necessarily see how to model and how to use that core board with that. I've also done some other book um, modeling side by sides, um, some simple songs, which I want to do more of, which I did a side by side where um, my idea for that was that staff could play that during like lunchtime when the preschoolers were eating in the classroom because they didn't go to the cafeteria or during snack time. Um, cause I found that a lot of my teachers were playing those videos anyway, and the kids all have access to core, but the teachers weren't modeling during that time. Um, they were doing lots of other things. So I just thought, well, maybe if I just do a side by side, um, that'll help. And then, you know, make the teachers know that, you know, everything that they're doing is still important. They've got to get the kids ready to go and all of that stuff and have a break, but they could, the kids could still be getting that modeling piece without an active person there. Um, so a lot of it is support for families, for professionals getting started as well. It's offer, offered up as things that they can look at. Um, and then adding in different resources that people can use while they're at school or to help them prep lessons and things like that. I love that. And and yes, those, those are some of the re ways and reasons that I've shared it. I love the idea of having it though, kind of be one more thing that we can just give them input. Like if there, mm -hmm. there's downtime, if there's five minutes, just, um, you know, put it on there, put it on the smart board, put it on your, uh, on your classroom board and just kind of give that input. Yeah. And, and it is universal. Like, even though, like you said, you're using one simple set and one software, like it could be extrapolated. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. um, the other thing that made, made me think of when you mentioned the Play-Doh, wouldn't it be cool if we had Play-Doh kits where we also had some figurines and or applicable things towards our stories where then they could have some manipulables and, um, you could have like little kits with that too. So just all kinds of things that you're yeah. You're making me think, Megan. Like I just, <laughs> I, I think it, I just 
making things come alive is is not always like something that's intuitive for right uh, especially our type a people right like they want to plan yes. they want it all packaged together and so kind of extrapolating into different students needs and abilities and ages can be mm-hmm. hard but i think don't overthink it is kind of the general yeah follow, follow yeah. them follow just make it come alive as much as possible yeah. um, we've mentioned comprehensive literacy for all which is mm-hmm. definitely a theme throughout this season when we look at Karen Erickson and um, David's work and just all the things they've done for literacy in, with this population but are there any other resources you would guide someone to that's getting started or wants to dive further into this topic or supports um, I think a lot of, as far as compre- as far as literacy or AAC or kind of both. Uh, I would say literacy, but if you have other AAC supports, anything really. I think a lot of the device companies are doing a lot more things with literacy. Like you mentioned the PRC stuff. I know Toby Dynavox is doing some more stuff with that too. Um, so always checking out those types of resources that are usually free or very small monetary cost. Um, also there's a lot of professional development out there, um, that is focusing more on literacy. Um, I know like the AAC in the cloud conference, which at the time of this recording is coming up, but they also have all of their previous recordings online too, that have a lot of literacy information, um, available in those as well. So, um, I do have another book. I'm looking over at my bookshelf right now to see what it is called because I wanna, don't want to butcher the name. Um, Practically Speaking is another one that's really good. It's more focused towards AAC, but it does have a touch of literacy stuff in there because they're so intertwined. Um, so that is another one that I have enjoyed. Caveat with that one, it is not as easy of reading as Comprehensive for Literacy. Um, comprehensive Literacy for All is. It's more textbook ish e it's kind of more dense but it's not one that you also would usually sit down and read like a novel or anything like that um there are a couple of other books that i have that are not on this bookshelf so i apologize if i am not saying their names right but um inclusive 365 is one that has recently come out um that is there and then there's also there's another one and i can't remember the name of it but I will tell you, oh, I can see it. I think it's by Chris Bouguet, um, but I can't remember the name of it. So I will look afterwards and I will yeah. send you the link yeah. for it. And we'll put that but, in the show uh, notes. That will be yeah. great. We'll just have kind of like a little list of, of additional reading resources right on on theme. And that Perfect. way, if, people, if listeners want to dive into those, they can. Yeah. Yeah. Chris always has really great ideas and, in, in, um, you know, Mike and all the all the, all the big wigs, they, they do, they have some really practical ideas. I know, I know for sure we have inclusive 365 in our instructional resource center that you guys could check out. Um, and I believe we have practical speaking, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but we'll definitely put the links in the show notes for everyone to kind of look at. And you actually, if you look on Megan's resources, um, you'll, you'll, the core board that she uses is very, should look very familiar because it's the same core board or similar core board that we use here in the district that we created for you guys. So there's some overlap there. So that in of itself is kind of a nice little, uh, small AAC world sync, (laughs) sync up. Um, anything else you would add as far as resources before I ask Um, you our, our final question? I don't think so. I mean, I try and add some things to my website. I do have a small blog that hasn't been updated either in a minute, but I'm working on it. Um, So hopefully you'll start to see more stuff pop up there as well. Um, And if there's anything in particular, anybody has any questions about, um, I'd love it if you would reach out to me and I would be happy to help you find that information because it may not be information that I have as well. Um, I always am a a constant learner and I love doing professional development stuff. So I would love any questions that make me think too are wonderful. So even if I don't have the answer, I will love helping you find it. So, yeah, especially like student specific. I know sometimes like those are some of the examples you share and and they're just really helpful because people can kind of see it come alive too in that way. Um, Okay. So before we land the plane, I have to ask you the question I ask everyone that comes on our podcast, which is just 
let us know what is your favorite moment, if you can choose just one, to date with an AAC user. Bonus if it's related to literacy, but I just love, these are my favorite. This is my favorite question because I get to hear something really great. <laughs> um, I've had so many. Um, I definitely would say the one that I said about where is the Turkish is like right up there on the top of my list. Um, but I had a little mini series in my Instagram earlier this at the like in the spring, what a four-year-old taught me about AAC, because mm -hmm. I had like three or four days in a row where I went into this classroom and it just happened that these four-year-olds were like on fire and like teaching me all of these things that I was like, what? Okay. Yeah, for sure. So one was a little guy, again, a four-year-old um, was on his AAC device and was on the shapes page. And they always listen to this shape song in the morning. And it's the only way I've ever learned anything beyond like Pentagon as for the name. So like, I know all these crazy shape names now, and it's only because of the song. So the song was playing and he was on his shapes page and he had his own way of telling me that those shapes were not there on his page. So he looked around and he found, he said one, two, three, four, five, six. And then he um, touched hexagon and then he counted to seven and then he touched a blank button mm. and looked at me. And I said, you're right. Heptagon is not on here. And he, again, just like Gabe did, just like lit up and was like, oh my gosh, she understands me. And so I added Heptagon. So then he counted to eight and then he found Octagon. And then he counted to nine and again, touched a different empty button. And then I said, you need me to add Nonagon? And he said, yeah, like he got all excited. He didn't say it, but he verb yeah. like non-verbally said it. Yeah. Um, and so I added Nonagon and then he found again, counted to 10 and found Decagon and was thrilled. And then we were done. And then don't you wonder you're like, well, why would they include the other ones and not Nonagon and have to God? Right. Like <laughs> yeah, it was so weird. And I was like, and everybody when I posted it on social media, people were like, How did you know? the names of those. I'm like, trust me, I am not a math person by any means. It was totally the song. Yeah. But um, so that and then um, again, being corrected by a four year old about whether it was a parallelogram or a um, diamond or a rhombus, I was being like the small person's word, I guess, and calling it a diamond, because that's what I thought it was. And again, this student is non-speaking for the most part and all of a sudden I heard him say <laughs> and I was like did you just say parallelogram mm -hmm. and he said <laughs> I got all excited and I was like oh my gosh sorry diamond oh, wasn't enough yeah yeah I was like that wasn't enough oh sorry the Amazon guy is coming to my oh, house yeah. right now so I have to be very protected probably I don't know if you can books. hear him. oh yeah uh-huh yeah. <laughs> yeah my dog's the same way yeah, they're they're built big and, and and fierce until someone walks in the door and then they're just love bugs. Exactly. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I know I just I love that, Megan. Like I I love everything about that. Right. Because it just goes back to the value of how we are all creative communicators and, mm -hmm. you know, that ability to use a combination of of gestures, of vocalizations, of using the device to count, right? Like yeah. all of that is building capacity. So even if you don't feel like you're building capacity when you're teaching some of those things and supporting it that way, like you still are. You still yeah. are. And then and then they correct you and show you how it's not a diamond. <laughs> Right. Exactly. I was like, diamond. okay, I won't call it a diamond anymore. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> it's a parallelogram. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. Okay. Well, uh, gosh, the things that we can learn and, and we're never, we're never not learning. So, right. Uh, if someone has a, a question, you had mentioned that you're open to, to mm -hmm. them reaching out, what would be the best way to get in contact with you? So, um, if you're on social, I am sensible literacy and it is S E N S E able literacy. Um, I know that's not the right way to spell it, but there's a reason why I spelled it that way. I guess that you can figure it out because I love sens sensory stuff and literacy and AAC and all of it. So um, I'm that on all social medias. Um, you can also reach me 
on my website, which is sensibleliteracy.com. There's, like I said, some blog posts up there. There's also links to my um, kits that are available. So if anybody wants to check those out, I do have some pre-made little kits with AAC supports, literacy um, supports, and then some of those extension activities that I talked about um, that you can purchase to be ready to go, or you can do digital downloads, all that fun stuff. But sensible literacy across everything is the easiest way to find me. Perfect. So we'll put that in the show notes if you guys are looking for it. And on behalf of Innovative AAC Solutions in the district, we just want to thank Megan for coming on today. It has been a pleasure. It has been so great. Definitely give her a follow and continue to check her out with upcoming things to come. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you. Thank you.